Hello, Internet, and good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. My name is Kevin Bankson, and I'm a fellow at Arizona State University Center for Science and the Imagination, which brings writers, artists, and other creative thinkers into collaboration with scientists, engineers, and technologists to reignite humanity's grand ambitions for innovation and discovery. I want to thank you for joining us today for our panel discussion on reimagining the future of X, how to build collective visions of the future using sci-fi and foresight tools. Wow, that was a really long title. I probably should have rethought that. This is the fourth and final event for now in CSI's Applied Sci-Fi series, made possible thanks to the Sloan Foundation. Uh, that project has sought to better understand the influence of sci-fi on technology and the people who build it, to study the specific ways that sci-fi storytelling can be applied as a tool for innovation and foresight, and to better leverage that tool in service of creating more diverse and sustainable futures. Our first event, which you can find by Googling for the sci-fi feedback loop, was focused on the history of sci-fi's influence on the course of technology development. Our second event was focused on the intersection of sci-fi and design in the form of design fiction. And our third panel was focused on the relationship between science fiction scenario planning and the field of strategic foresight. Today, we are going to talk about how over the past decade or so, there's been a growing trend of projects from think tanks, companies, academics, and advocates that use collections of sci-fi stories, artwork, and nonfiction essays to help policymakers, the public, or some other particular audience to better imagine a variety of potential futures on a specific topic or for a specific community. At their best, these Future of X projects combine a range of the various applied sci-fi techniques we've discussed in previous events to generate a diverse set of compelling visions of the future of a topic, whether it's the future of warfare or work or cities or social justice or climate change, just to name a few examples. And regardless of whether it's being done as a multi-year grant-funded multimedia project by one of the think tanks here in DC to educate policymakers or independently published on a shoestring to serve as advocacy and inspiration for a social movement or run as a creative weekend writing sprint to help a local community group imagine its neighborhood's future. But what makes for an effective Future of X project that can actually broaden society's thinking or even an individual's thinking and help impact decision-making about our shared technological future. Well, luckily we have an amazing panel of science fiction writers and foresight experts who've worked on a wide range of such projects to help us answer those questions. But first, we're gonna have some brief introductory remarks, dare I say, perhaps inspiring introductory remarks from another notable expert in the realm of imagining the future and imagining the past for that matter, author Annalee Newitz. Um, I had the pleasure of first meeting Annalee uh, when they were a policy analyst and I was a lawyer at the Electronic Frontier Foundation in the long, long ago. And I just have to say the amount of amazing, cool, nerdy stuff they've managed to accomplish since then just blows my mind. Um, Annalee writes science fiction and nonfiction. Uh, they're the author of three novels, including the recently published, oh, here it is, Terraformers. Um, while as a science journalist, they are the author of two books, including Four Lost Cities, A Secret History of the Urban Age. They are also, uh, they've also written for the New York Times, uh, have a monthly column in New Scientist and have published in The Post, Slate, Popular Science, Ars Technica, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and many, many others. And they are the co-host with Charlie Jane Anders of the always entertaining Hugo award-winning podcast, Our Opinions Are Correct. And if that wasn't enough nerd cred, they were previously the founder of io9, the best sci-fi news site online, in my humble opinion, uh, and served as the editor-in-chief of Gizmodo. So they've clearly been busy and I just want to thank them again for taking the time to join us and talk about the future of X. Anna Lee. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this, Kevin. Um, this is going to be a great conversation. And these are all speakers who I whose work I follow and admire. So I'm just excited to be here um, and to participate a little bit. So I first encountered the idea of applied science fiction when I wrote a short story for the Project Hieroglyph Anthology back in 2011, and that was spearheaded by the Center for Science and the Imagination, and it was inspired by Neil Stevenson's idea that we should write science fiction about solving big problems. And this was a big turning point for me as a writer. And one thing that it impressed upon me was that futuristic stories don't just exist on a continuum of dystopian to utopian. They're also on a problem-solving continuum, where on one side, 
you have people writing about fixing broken systems. And on the other side, you have people whose writing is all about admiring problems, but without suggesting any solutions. I prefer not to admire problems, but it's tempting, especially when you're dealing with huge systemic problems like climate change or racism. It's very tempting to just sit back and stare at all the multi-layered toxicity and just give up. I mean, there's a lot of science fiction that's like that, where there's just this bleak, nihilistic vibe and humanity lives in a trash can. It's a way of saying that there is no future, except there always will be a future. That's literally how linear time works. And if we don't plan for that future, it's going to be chaotic, unjust, and destructive to our ecosystems. And I've long believed that public policy is a form of very near science fiction. It can certainly provide guidelines for us. It can help us allocate resources. But public policy doesn't solve the basic problem of how we imagine ourselves in a world that's very different from this one, a world in which our descendants are dealing with novel threats but still find ways to thrive. That's where storytelling comes in. When we tell stories about the future, we put our policy ideas and our scientific innovations into a living context. Stories help us imagine how people will follow regulations, but also how they'll break them and why. They help us prepare for the knock-on effects of new inventions, both the political consequences and the personal costs. They allow us to explore how present day conflicts might evolve, but also how people a generation from now might work together and forge alliances. Most importantly though, stories about the future help us empathize with people who do not exist yet. They remind us that the choices we make now will have consequences and that real human beings and other life forms will be living in the gardens and the cages that we build for them today. Best of all, Stories teach us that there are always many pathways out of our problems. And that's what the people on this panel today are here to talk about. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Annalie. Uh, we all really appreciate it. I'm gonna hand it over now uh, to Joey Eshrish on the CSI team, who is going to be moderating our panel of experts who are going to be introducing them shortly. I am going to step in to the background um, have a great panel, everybody. Thank you, Kevin. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joey Eshrick, and as Kevin said, I uh, work at the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University, where I'm the uh, managing editor. And I've had the great honor and privilege to work with many of the folks on this panel, although not all of you. And so hopefully we'll remedy that soon. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're gonna do a quick round of intros. I'd like everybody to introduce themselves. You can hear from everyone right up top uh, in their own voice, um, but we're each gonna just say who we are and then say a sort of futures focused, future of X type project um, that we've worked on. Annalie, I think you could skip all of this because we, <laughs> we just heard all of that from you. Um, the one I will pick on uh, is a project called um, Solar Tomorrows, which is an ongoing project at Arizona State University, where we imagine the cultural and social dimensions of an energy transformation toward clean renewables um, and how they'll reshape our cities and our communities and our nations, our governance. Um, and that's a, a project that we're still working on. We actually have some fellows uh, who are teachers and educators working right now to take the narratives that came out of that project and repurpose them as teaching materials for audiences of all ages. Um, I will call on folks. I think that's going to make things easier. Tobias, would you like to go first? Uh, hi, I'm Tobias Buckel. I'm a Caribbean-born science fiction fantasy author uh, who currently lives in Ohio. And I've been lucky enough to see uh, 15 books of my work published, 130 short stories, and have been published in 19 different languages. And the two sort of uh, projects that I've worked on are one with Joey. I worked on Year Without a Winter, which kind of examined uh, ecological futures, and also um, Karen Lord, uh, Bayesian, Barbada, uh, Bayesian writer from Barbados, uh, and I uh, co-edited Reclaim, Restore, Return, Futurist Tales from the Caribbean, which we partnered with Bocas uh, Lit Fest to sort of create a workshop um, and 
also an anthology that came out of that. Great, thank you. Uh, Tori. Hello everyone, my name is Tori Stevens. I am the creative manager of climate fiction at Grist Magazine, a nonprofit media organization that's focused on climate solutions, justice, and the environment generally. However, the project that I manage, Imagine 2200, Climate Fiction for Future Ancestors, is all about trying to imagine a hopeful future. How do we get to that clean, green, and just world? And how do we activate people to not write, well, I, I wouldn't say not write dystopian stories, but you know, counter it with like a lot more hopeful stories. Um, so you'll see stories that are driven um, about the future that is um, embedded in like hope and justice and um, getting to that beautiful world that we all wanna live in. So happy to chop it up with this crew here. Um, yeah, uh, and I'll pass it back to Joey. Thanks so much. Uh, next we'll hear from Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Johnson. I'm a visiting research fellow at the Language and Technology Lab at MIT. More broadly, I'm a writer, scholar, and facilitator of speculation. And for one recent project, um, I partnered with the National Democratic Institute to put together a global anthology that explores positive visions of democracy. And this was a, a really fun project. It was um, it, it used an innovative distributed structure that built from a wonderful editorial collaboration with speculative fiction magazine teams around the world. Um, I just need to give them a shout out because they are there too. Um, Mafagafo and Ataverna in Brazil, Omenina in Nigeria, and Nicola Review in India. And each of them ran a themed issue. And then I ended up uh, selecting from these sets of stories for the global anthology. And finally, uh, August. Uh, thanks, Joey. Uh, August Cole. I am a managing partner at Useful Fiction and a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center on Strategy and Security. Uh, it's a kind of a long way to say that I, you know, spend uh, my days thinking about the future of conflict uh, and using narrative to better understand that. Uh, with Peter Singer, I wrote a book called Ghost Fleet, uh, and very much in the same spirit of trying to kind of crack some of these big uh, thorny uh, challenges about uh, conflict with China. In 2020, we wrote a book called Burn In about um, what is America's future with AI in the everyday sense? Like, how is it going to change everything from the family to the work to extremism? And since then, we've been applying that methodology um, that we, you know, had for our novels, which are novels with endnotes, right? They're a little bit different than your typical techno thriller, to uh, working with the U.S. government uh, and allies on trying to understand the future of conflict. And, you know, that has led to, you know, working on everything from the future of quantum computing uh, and writing uh, short stories you know, to that effect, commissioning art uh, to tackling uh, you know the future of special operations and so uh it's a it's a real privilege to get to go after these big hard problems and and to kind of find ourselves you know working alongside with people who every day are, are dedicated to that thank you all so much for those uh very uh succinct introductions and uh i look forward to delving into all the things you brought up more um so what we're going to do is, is get into a few questions about these future of X projects that, that I prepared um, along with Kevin, and uh, we will kind of bounce between them. I'm going to kind of address them loosely to, you know, one person, probably two people, but I, I want you all to jump in. Um, and I hope that we can have a dialogue around them. We'll get to what we can get to. We have an hour here. We now have 46 minutes. Um, we're going to leave a little bit of time at the end, if we can, for um, Q&A, but there's a certain amount of this we want to get through. So if you do have questions, there is a Q&A um, box at the bottom of Zoom. Please use that. Um, and I will keep an eye on those. And we will accommodate at least a couple of questions, if we can, um, before we squeak to the end of the hour here. Um, but without any further ado, um, I want to start by by talking about some of the underlying why questions. So, you know, who are these projects for? Like Kevin and Annalie laid out a scope for what they're trying to accomplish, but you know, if they are not getting found and read, and if people don't find them compelling and useful, then you know, it's a tree falls in the forest situation. So, um, I want to start by asking about the market for these future of X type projects, the, the intended audience. It's often the first question that contributors ask when we um, approach them um, for these projects. Who are they directed to and why? And who's interested to sort of support and pay for them and make them possible uh, and sustainable? So I want to start um, with Grist, actually, and with Imagine 2200, Tori. Um, 
Those are supported, as I understand, at least in part by the National Resources Defense Council. Um, but I'd you know, love to hear uh, who the intended audience of this project is and, and how you conceptualize that and sort of uh, how you imagine their, their needs and interests and investment um, in, in the stories you're producing. Yeah, that's a really good question. I would say that, you know, in the beginning, we didn't really have an audience for this. I just had a hunch that there was an audience for this. I knew that there's people out there that like climate fiction. I know that there's people who care about hope, justice, and solutions. And our goal was to find them so that that tree in the woods problem didn't happen. And what we found is that there's an overwhelming amount of people that are interested in this work. Um, in the first year, we had 130,000 views of the collective stories. Um, and in the second year, it moved up to 200,000. And the other thing that we found is that people are lingering and reading the stories a lot longer than the news article, which is quite interesting at a news organization, you know, and just at a place that lives online, you know, Grist is an only digital media organization. So, you know, we have all those numbers that we track and we can see that people are reading it. But what I really found interesting that is an audience because I didn't know exactly who would be who would gravitate towards this. The first, I'll talk about the writers, right? So our contest or initiative, we put out a big call to action, a call for submissions for stories that are focused on hope, justice, and solutions. And what we've attracted is writers from across the globe. Um, in the first year, we had 86 countries represented and 1,100 writers submit stories. And so that is a huge audience for us, the, the writers who dream up these worlds that we, you know, want to read and, and um, really see their perspective on what the future could look like. You know, it's very different from someone who grew up in Thailand versus someone who grew up in like the suburbs of Wisconsin, you know, so I find that stuff really interesting. So that's one aspect, um, the writers. And we've been in touch with those writers and every year um, there's more writers. We're in our third year. We just closed our call for submissions last night at um, midnight. Um, and so, you know, three years, lots of writers there, but then there's the readers. Who are the folks that are gonna pick this stuff up? And what I found is that, you know, folks who write climate fiction, um, folks who write solar punk stories, those are the folks that are interested. But then also we've been testing and pushing the, you know, that's our core audience, I would say, is folks who really are like, I love a climate fiction story. I love a solar punk story. But there's other folks that are gravitating to these stories. And what they've said is they're people who just don't like the news but they care about like the environment, what's going on with climate change in our climate crisis, but they don't wanna hear like the negative, what they would call, and I'm kind of re repeating what we've done some surveys on our readers. And, you know, I've heard things like, I can't stand the news, it's negative, it's divisive. I love that you're working on solutions, you're focused on hope. Um, and I just, I like to get my orientation from story. So. I would say those are our big audience, like the core audience of solar punk and climate fiction folks, and then the writers that we've been working with for the past three years. But then we're pushing this out to the grist audience that they've developed over the past 20 years. And you can see that there's folks, so there's those folks that care about and like the news, but then there's others who find out about this contest and they're just like, I don't like the news, I just love a good story. Yeah, that idea of like these multiple layers of audiences, and especially the writers themselves is sort of like the probably the most vociferous consumers of the fiction is uh, very, very much resonates for me. Amy, I'm interested um, in in your response to this, um, because you've recently led this sort of multi tiered multi publication um, effort with uh, the National Democratic uh, Institute. Uh, like, how did you all think about audience and sort of like, who you were trying to aspirationally reach and, and sort of who you thought of as the core readership? That's a great question. Um, NDI, National Democratic Institute, uh, had a very clear right from the beginning uh, wanting to focus on a global audience um, and to work with, they have, they have branches uh, all around the world. And so they wanted to share their materials with those audiences. Um, yeah. 
I, I think uh, in that particular case, I was a little less involved in who was uh, in defining who got to be the audience because that was part of a much larger future of democracy project that they were working on also with two other NGOs. And so there's a little bit of a difference there. So August, if, if it's all right, I, I, I wanna pick on you a little bit and, and ask about some of these dynamics in terms of the kind of, um, I don't know, I'd call it like a walking and chewing gum kind of approach of like trying to tell compelling stories that are also going to be uh, usable and uh, illuminate policy issues. And perhaps people who, uh, you know, are approaching something like the, the techno thrillers that you've worked on with a lot of insider and professional expertise, you know, and the same thing could be true of um, the democracy, pro-democracy politics, or certainly the climate crisis. Um, how do you kind of like structure the projects or uh, even like the longer tail after publication to, to make sure you're kind of like serving that audience? Because it does seem like it's built so much into the DNA of the project itself. Yeah, it's a it's an awesome question. You know, for a for a novel length project, you know, like we did with Ghost Fleet and, and Burn In, you know, our ambition is to be both like educational so that someone can read an enjoyable, you know, piece of fiction and come away better, you know, sort of smarter on something that might otherwise be just kind of like outside their field of vision or over the horizon. And so we start the project with that very much in mind. If you go back to like when we started working on our first book, Ghost Fleet, has been you know, 2013 and, and people didn't want to talk about conflict with China that much outside of a very core community. And we were looking at a lot of data and a lot of trends and thought, okay, you know, we're going to take a fictional narrative to kind of unpack this and explain what, what the consequences might be. But underpinning all that was research. You know, I have a nonfiction background. I used to be a journalist, you know, finishing my career at the Wall Street Journal before kind of leaping off into do this stuff over a decade ago. And Peter Singer, my uh, co-writer, you know, has a PhD in, in, a, in, a, in political science and a nonfiction background. So we, we naturally gravitate towards facts. And as people who like to make stuff up, you know, we underpin it. And so that is part of what we're trying to think about when we consider the audience. So a book needs to go broadly, right? Because you want it to sell well, but also when you have this ambition to make it useful, you know, you're thinking about like some of these problems we're trying to get our hands around um, require fresh voices, people who don't get to be part of these conversations and story travels so well for that way better than, you know, say a nonfiction book like we could have written or a think tank white paper or a policy memo, et cetera. And so the the the, the kind of message is the, the, the medium is the message, you know, to kind of butcher that, that phrase, I guess. And, you know, I think that's a really valuable thing when you get to do a commercial fiction project. When you're doing something more like an anthology that's commissioned, you know, maybe by a department or, you know, I've done this with the Atlantic Council too on future of conflict. You have to really think too about that question of utility, but also, you know, frankly, entertainment, right? Like a story is no good if nobody gets to the end of it. So you're trying to design that in from the start. And when we work with the, the you know, folks we, we do our commission fiction for, it's often a real upfront conversation about like, what are you trying to kind of communicate? What are you trying to help people understand? What are you trying to understand, right? The doing often unlocks the things as well. And, and I think that internal piece is often missed in these, you know, kind of big futures projects that getting uh, like, I guess for lack of a better, a client or partner to that place where they're really able to articulate that, sometimes that's not often easily done and it takes a lot of back and forth. And to me, that's become, you know, as we kind of invent the, our process and how we're doing it, like this is, you know, we're just making this up as we go along essentially uh, in, our, in our case. And, you know, that has been one of the really nice revelations is that process because it's really meaningful and you get a deeper relationship. And in turn, it helps that, that you know, message, you know, get carried through story to like a, a broader audience. So it's both like, you know, an internal kind of, you know, process, but also an external audience that you have to have uh, designed in from the start. I think you cannot do it, you know, post fact. Thanks for that. I, I want to go to Tobias. I'm just like doing a round robin on this question, but uh, I, I want to hear a little bit more, if you don't mind, about the Caribbean Futures Project that you and Karen Lord uh, did that you talked about briefly, because I know that that was actually uh, deployed kind of at a literary festival to a specific audience. And so you had a kind of audience of, I and I'll let you expand on this, but of uh, policymakers and sort of people connected to, to public policy um, that, that you actually were just putting the book directly into their hands and you knew it would get there. So I, I, I'd love to hear that about was, that yeah, and, that and maybe how that changed the, your approach. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Reclaim and Restore Return uh, was sponsored by the Bocas Literary Festival in Trinidad. 
Um, and they tasked us to do a workshop and an anthology. So the initial workshop was to work with a number of writers to sort of uh, teach them some of the things we were just talking about, like how to, you know, engage in sort of design fiction, but not be pedantic because that's the one thing everyone gets really scared about. Like, oh, I don't want to read a climate change story because I'm afraid I'm going to be lectured at. I don't want to read a piece of science fiction because I feel like I'm going to be lectured at about math and science. And, and if they've had negative experiences in the past with those, those topic areas, they, they tend to be very tentative. Um, so it was just trying to sort of run through some exercises that those of us who write a lot of science fiction are really familiar uh, with having as problems. You know, how do you, how do you make that sort of world building you know come alive on the page and how do you deal how do you not be pedantic if you're trying to talk about these really big questions right um and what are the different strategies you can deploy and there are a number of different literary strategies you can deploy um to sort of overcome that and make the stories very enjoyable and get people to the end as you were saying um and that's incredibly important um, and so putting this one together was just, we were doing the two things. We were hoping that it would get into the hands of people at the festival because it's a very big deal um, and held in Trinidad and attracts a lot of um, people who might have influence um, and uh, be taken by these stories. But also we were trying to do the same thing that uh, uh, Corey I was just talking about, which was um, we were trying to, uh, uh, Tori at Gris was saying that like, you know, it was trying to get writers to reimagine and, and think about the other things out there. And I think this is really incredibly important, um, what Tori was saying, because um, I have this uh, I have this huge essay I'm, I'm trying to put together about bad metaphors that exist in fiction that we keep reusing in fiction and in pop culture over and over and over again. And I think they're actually really damaging because the power of story and metaphor is that we can take it, we can reduce a really complex problem and make it a, a slogan, right? And when you match and marry the metaphor to the problem, you tend to take on just the metaphor. So when someone says like, you know, um, as a household with my personal finances, I would never take on this much debt. And therefore the country is going to be screwed because if you took on that much debt as an individual, you too would be screwed, right? And um, that's a bad metaphor because that's not how macroeconomics works. It's not a household, um, but it's such a compelling metaphor. It gets repeated yeah. and used and you see it all over the place. And I think that, you know, teaching us to use better metaphors other than we're screwed is really important part of um, training up our storytellers because otherwise you get something like, you know, look at how common like torture is used by good guys in action movies these days, right? Yeah. When I grew up in the 1980s, we never saw that. Only the bad guys use torture. Now, people I'm supposed to empathize with and hold to a high moral standards do brutal and horrible things to people to save their country or to, you know, save their family, right? And, um, you know, do we ever sit down with these writers and kind of give them the close look at whether that works or not? No, it's just assumed as a metaphor that this is a step that the hero has to go through in order to get the right information. So those metaphors, I think, are incredibly important. And that's why, actually, I think people might gloss over what Tori just said. But it's actually kind of key, I think. Yeah, it's the moral and psychological machinery of the story structure that's like taking over for the larger reality, it takes over and blots out the referent of like the larger world and the actual exactly. as you said, like dynamics. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Annalie, I saw you nodding a lot, and and so I wanted to invite invite you to either respond to Tobias or or weigh in on this uh, this audience question before we take a left turn that I'm planning. Oh, um, I just wanted to say, hurry up and finish that essay, uh, Tobias, because I'd love to read it. I think it's true that um, one of the real issues that we face as we bring these ideas to an audience is that we don't want certain metaphors to calcify around the stories that we're telling. Um, and that's why it's so important to be reaching out to writers and readers as we do these projects. Thank you for that. So uh, I, I have so much more to ask here, but I, I want us to cover some other things. So uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, sort of connected elements that I, I want to cover here uh, is the way that actually speaking of like metaphors and things and stuff, it, it is frequently tempting to talk about these products in terms of the outputs or artifacts that they create, but they're also um, important as sort of social processes uh, and prompts for for creative people as 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 we've been talking about and as Tobias was was saying that can hopefully like 
catalyze new types of thinking or uh, redirect uh, people's creative energies. So, uh, Amy, I'm going to kind of aim this uh, <laughs> this hose at you, but um, uh, what if the primary audience, or, or I know there's projects here, I guess, where, where, where the primary audience is an audience that's participating in the process and co-creating, um, because the goal is maybe to expose a, a particular community of, of creators or thinkers to these new sorts of foresight or futures tools or habits of minds, or to help build a community or, around a set of ideas um, or a set of goals. Um, so I'm interested in, in how you've worked with that kind of project structure and that kind of imperative at the center of these projects as social processes and organized processes and not just like sprints toward an output. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I think the panel already has touched on how a lot of the folks who are doing these kinds of projects, uh, who are publishing the projects, aren't standard publishing houses, right? Like these are different kinds of organizations. And often it's not uh, traditional professional creative writers who are writing the stories. There's like a whole subset where it's people who are scholars or activists are, are writing the stories and sharing their visions of the future. So uh, for example, in one of my projects, um, this spring, I wrapped up an anthology that was part of a research sprint run by the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. Um, the sprint itself was themed around digital ID in times of crisis. And so for 10 weeks, people from around the world gathered together to explore this topic through a variety of different modalities. Um, but these were not people who identified um, as writers. Um, I mean, scholarly writers, yes. Uh, they were scholars, they were digital rights advocates, technologists. And one of the tracks was a speculative fiction track. Um, and by the end of our track, everybody had written and workshopped a story um, and then sort of thought about what it was that speculative fiction was giving them and bringing to their approach. One of the things that we did for the anthology was uh, interview each of the participants. Each of the participants interviewed each other to see how things had changed. Um, and consistently they were describing having new insights, believing that new things were possible. Um, and it's just, um, I think really speaks to the idea that the process can be transformative in and of itself. Um, and actually, I think that this particular project um, also speaks to another useful point, which is that you can use speculative fiction and future of X projects in addition to other modalities, right? Like they don't have to be the sole approach um, and they can contribute. So in this case, it was speculative fiction, data visualization and policy approaches that people were making and thinking together. And it was, um, so it wasn't just the group who were writing the stories who were being transformed by this process. It was also the group that was the larger piece studying um, digital ID from different angles. Do other folks have uh, responses, questions for Amy or experiences to share that maybe are a little bit more like that insights on uh, process or project structure that gets it again, like shifting the perhaps agenda or, or focus or perspective of a, of a community of people who might then go on to, to do their own work in these areas. August, yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, Peter and I just came back from the UK where we worked at their Defense Academy, uh, working with mid-career officers, uh, you know, who have extensive, you know, military service time behind them and are at a point where they're learning, you know, theory and, and technology and things like that. And, and you know, part of our, our work with them over this uh, workshop, you know, was getting to, you know, hear from writers and, and creatives, et cetera, but also we take them through the story generation process, you know, and they're not going to write the story itself in that workshop, but they're going to go through understanding, you know, how to think about what it is you're trying to communicate and why and, you know, character and things like that. And that act of doing can be incredibly helpful for just like almost at a neurological level, kind of unlocking things. And, you know, we've seen that in those short interactions like that, you know, with again over a couple hundred people, but also when we get to mentor writers where we spend in many cases months, you know, kind of working with them, uh, people who are not professional writers, but that act of doing becomes as much, I think, as an important output as something, you know, you hold in your hands, uh, especially if you're in a community where that kind of writing is not part of what you've been trained or, or kind of evaluated on. Uh, and I think that's a really valuable thing for, for people to be able to kind of think differently, which is, which is incredibly important, especially in national security right now. Anybody who's looking at, you know, conflict and security, um, you know, everything is kind of up in the air uh, on, on so many levels. And so if you can conceive of ways to do things differently alongside, as Amy said, the traditional aspects of foresight or, you know, doctrine, whatever, um, it's one tool among many, but it can be a really valuable process. Yeah. I mean, I think the, 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 
the, the power of story, right? Because uh, one of the most fruitful uh, moments I've ever had was talking to a large group of scientists um, about communication, trying to communicate their findings um, about climate change and the sort of uh, moving away from uh, just, uh, you know, I'm not knocking it because I'm a super rationalist myself. I love a good chart, right? Like a charts are what sinks the fear of like, you know, the oncoming heat into me, but uh, uh, working with them and showing them examples of stories that land, including advertising, you know, and how that power of metaphor, how that power of storytelling activates the recipient's brains in a way that just giving them a lot of facts does not. Um, like they have to be able to tell some kind of story about their research, or it's really hard to get that across to the rest of the world. Right. And um, just sitting them in there with a couple of science fiction writers and having them brainstorm based on stuff they were telling me they were, they were researching and seeing them begin to sort of like figure out a story path or a way of telling their story out of that um, was really exciting for me. Um, and they came up with some really interesting ideas out of just a, you know, 30, 40 minute encounter. Um, seeing more of that cross fertilization, I think, is just really important. So, uh, you know, as we're talking about, uh, and thank you all for, for your insights there, as we're sort of talking about what uh, building communities around these projects, changing people's ways of thinking, giving them new kind of um, starting points, framings, tools for kind of metabolizing the future. Um, I want to talk a little bit about another kind of flavor uh, or spin of, of, on, I don't know what metaphor to choose myself, uh, on these Future of X projects, which is, which is contests. And so, you know, we've, uh, I'll share at the Center for Science and the Imagination. We've we've co-hosted a number of of contests, including uh, three around the climate crisis, um, and uh, we've also done a number of projects that share a lot of features with with some of the ones that have been talked about so far, where we're bringing together experts, we're doing workshops, we're you know uh, taking writers on retreats into the desert, and you know all kinds of things that are meant to sort of generate creativity and bring people together, um, you know, and hopefully be mind expanding in some way. Um, and I'm, we're often thinking about what to optimize for. You know, we're trying to optimize for galvanizing people around a particular challenge, increasing the salience, you know, with climate, it's like everybody, you know, a lot of people are worried about it, but the, the question is how salient is it in your decision-making about who to vote for, you know, just, you know, buying decisions, work decisions, career path, uh, where to live, things like that. Um, but then, where we, you can also optimize for entertainment value or uh, just raw audience, or uh, as August was talking about, about the particular needs uh, of a client, there can almost be a sort of like training or acculturation uh, purpose. Um, so I, I think the contests are a real uh, uh, in, interesting example of that. You know, people often have the idea to do contests. And when we're talking to folks, uh, in formative stages, one of the things I always ask is just like, well, okay, like, why do you want to do this? Contests are a lot of work. Like, it's really, really hard. It's kind of emotionally exhausting. Um, and, uh, you know, they have a particular structure uh, because you're, you're, you're soliciting lots and lots of fiction, but you can only publish a tiny percentage of it uh, and, and, and put it back out to the community. So, I mean, Tori, I want to circle back to you uh, because you're, you just closed a contest, but, um, why a contest rather than commissioning for Imagine 2200? Certainly like Grist is a magazine and news organization could have commissioned like pretty much anyone they wanted. Um, why go for a contest and and uh, what, what are some of the challenges and, and, and kind of particular unique affordances of, of doing a contest versus one of these other project structures we've discussed? Yeah, I think it will, it's about that perspective piece that I was talking about or touching on earlier. So when you, you know, if you commission a story or a few stories for a collection, you know, you're going to work with these authors, these writers to, you know, they're going to work on a small team, our team plus them, and we have our perspectives, but it doesn't source the question, the prompt or what we want out of the project to the whole globe, like we're doing with Imagine 2200. So I think that is like a core component and an important piece that, you know, there's things that people have dreamed up that I wouldn't be able to kind of, you know, work um, with, uh, you know, bring together through my team and the others, um, the potential writers that we would work with. So I think that's a big element of this. The other part is that it also has a um, aspect where 
it gets the word out about the fact that we're trying to do something different. So there's like a call to action that we're putting out there consistently for three months out of the year that we're looking for hopeful stories. So that marketing aspect, but I, I, I don't like the term, even though I use marketing tactics, I would say like more of like the advocacy around changing for us, what is happening in climate fiction. Love dystopian stories. I'm a huge consumer of them, but I also want stories that have hope and justice and solutions at the heart of them because I, I need those to keep me going. And I, I know others do. So um, there's like this dual aspect to a contest. Sometimes though, I will say that at the end, um, when we've selected our 12 stories, there's a lot of like real, like for instance, in the first year, we got 1,100 stories. I would say there was close to 200 B plus to A stories that we had to leave on the cutting room floor until we had a plan for those. So there is that aspect of it where, geez, all these perspectives are not getting out into the world because we just don't have the capacity to publish them. So I would say that there is like a consideration there um, and one of the things we've done now is we're starting to publish some of those stories. We reach out to the authors and say, hey, um, if you haven't sold the rights to these stories, if you'd love to publish with us, if it still exists, if you're still proud of this story, would you like to publish with us? So we've been getting out um, some of those stories, but still, um, you know, there's a back catalog of a ton of stories that we, and we do encourage people to submit them in other places because we really just want to get these perspectives out there because a big component of this for us is not necessarily that like the solution is gonna be something that's like people gravitate towards and it changes society in this big kind of moment, but more that we get people talking about the climate crisis we're in. We wanna like get people thinking and talking about this. And we think story is a really powerful way to get people at the dinner table or um, online or in different spaces to, you know, libraries have been a huge place where we have a book now. Um, the first collection was turned into um, a book. And so that has been another way for people to engage this content. And libraries have been, you know, um, having book clubs and different talks that, you know, are around the climate, but climate fiction being something that more and more people are gravitating towards. Um, those have been some of the, um, you know, circles that people have been convening. So yeah, it's been really lovely to see. And I think like, you know, there's a world definitely where a contest doesn't play the main role in like commissioning work is like, you know, you can be really targeted in your approach, but I like the idea of like, I never know what I'm gonna get, you know, by sourcing and just putting the prompt out there to the world. Yeah, it is tough even just like, I remember when we did our first contest, we got a bunch of stories from Macedonia and a bunch of stories from the Philippines, which is like, I don't know anybody in either of those places. And so uh, through the open calls that we did and encouraging people to share, like there was just this snowball effect of like us getting to read stories from geographies, human and physical geographies that we just wouldn't have uh, been able to connect to with our current networks. Like, and it, you know, I mean, the world's a big place. So I, I think these, with climate, that seems especially important it's not any really really any less important with AI or anything else but like as a particular socio-scientific area like climate seems like you really do need to be hearing from people in places that you don't um, have on-ground experience and uh, the contest yeah. as an invitational form could do that yeah and I just like to add one thing just for everyone here is like I and I probably knew this like three years ago but the power of hashtags like a simple <laughs> hashtag can make it so that you know, some like someone from Macedonia picks up because they have an interest in that cataloged or that specific topic. And yeah, you just never know what you're going to get. So yeah. I, I fully believe in how hashtags um, can, you know, get this out there into the world. There's the tactical nuggets that we need to surface in this conversation. Uh, Tobias, go ahead. And then Amy, I wanted to hear from you for uh, just how you handled this challenge of, of writers, but Tobias, please go go ahead first. I think like, uh, again, some of the stuff Tori was talking about shows you the importance of processes and thinking about end goals, um, because I've been invited to a couple of Project of X type things or climate change, uh, you know, invited to contribute a climate change story. And quite often the people organizing it see the creation of the object as the end goal 
if we can just put all these stories about climate together in an anthology, we can save the world and raise awareness. And from the publishing side, the publishing creator side, actually like, you know, a short story anthology is probably one of the least read objects in the publishing <laughs> universe, unfortunately. And people yeah. don't seem to realize this. It's not mm -hmm. a solution. It's all the activity around the anthology. That's the, the, the yeah. thing, the process that Tori's talking about libraries, book clubs, reading them, publishing the stories on the website, hashtags. This is all process and community, not object. And I think that's really important. That's if there's one takeaway that I would say based on like the, the uh, you know, the reason Joey said that writers always ask him like, well, what's the audience and what's, what's, what is this? Um, it's actually the first thing I tend to ask as well. You know, and when the answer comes back, it's an anthology. Like, what, what, what more do you need? Um, then, at that point, understand that your writer then goes, well, then, you know, all I then care about is like how much you're going to pay me for this, right? Like, it, because if it's only the anthology and the object, then it's not part of the cause. It's not part of the conversation. It's just another story being commissioned for an anthology, right? And it becomes just sort of this different thing. Right, because at the back of your head, you're going like, "Oh, yeah, an anthology that 200 people will read. Great, okay. Yeah. You know, let's spend a lot of time on this for you know $300, or in many cases, nothing, because someone's calling and saying, "Hey, you do climate change, and we really care about the climate, and we're doing an anthology. We'd like a story for free." Um, so yeah, it's the process, not not the object. I think is really important. Yeah, uh, so it's just worth saying novels, you know, read more than anthologies, but still a tiny percentage of the public actually like likes reading novels regularly. Kim Stanley Robinson says he's done about 500 events about his climate novel, The Ministry for the Future. And that's the work as much as writing the book, I think, really. It, you know, if you think of, if he's just trying to think of impact on uh, global discourse about the climate crisis, um, you know, I think he feels like he has to do it, even though he doesn't always like to do that many events, uh, like that he has to sort of steward, steward the book forward and make sure that it's, uh, you know, the people who are interested in it, in it are, are, you know, guided towards uh, being able to understand and utilize what the book's prompting them to think about and do. Um, Amy, I just wanted to hear really quickly, maybe about since uh, the, the Democracy Project, how you dealt with the fact that you are have a small funnel and you can't publish everyone. What do you, uh, how do you think about that challenge? And then I want to try to get to a couple more things. I'm terrible about managing time. As well. I'll be quick. <laughs> Um, I can just echo a lot of what Tori and Tobias already said, that thinking about the larger process is also key. And I think this is a space that when you're working with an organization that doesn't think in publishing terms and so has little idea of what kind of impact an anthology might have, is it can be helpful to articulate this within the concept of the theory of change, where the theory of change is not only the anthology and who reads the anthology, but it is also all of those writers who are dreaming of different stories, who maybe never draft it, but they think about it. The ones who do draft it and then submit it and it gets rejected. And then the ones who do su submit it and it gets accepted, but the ones that don't submit it, I mean, uh, the ones that do submit it and aren't accepted, those stories are gonna be circulating outside, right? Like they're gonna be going as, as, as Tori was pointing to, like they're gonna be going to other magazines. They're gonna be uh, forming the anchor of a collection. They might become the seed of a novel. Like those are not mm -hmm. dead pieces. That is actually like a fundamental yeah. piece of the theory of change and sort of the change that's happening through this project. Yeah, we've definitely seen that with our climate anthologies too. Now that we're seven years from doing our first one in 2016, like many of those people have gone on to write climate books and write for other venues and pursue careers. And, uh, you know, perhaps they would have done that anyway, but it's cool to see that we were a stop along the way and perhaps, uh, you know, helped uh, m motivate and sort of be the wind at their backs a little bit or, or one one little piece of, you know, one little power up along the way. Um, Okay, so I actually want, uh, uh, I'm gonna kind of point at uh, uh, Annalie, August, and Tobias uh, about the next thing I wanted to ask about, which is um, coming to these as a writer, and I know August, you've probably, I mean, you've really sort of been on, on both sides of this and probably all three of you have, but um, when you're getting approached for this kind of project or when you're thinking about writing a piece that is a kind of future of X piece, you know, it's a unique kind of uh, story because again, it's not just like sort of like supposed to be, uh, um, you know, the most compelling uh, entertainment product you can create, but it's it's sort of meant to like fulfill all of these uh, goals at the same time. And we've talked about the kind of like layering of different audiences. What's, 
what's been helpful or been difficult for you when you had to uh, work with editors or sort of coordinators around these kinds of projects? What makes it for a good prompt uh, or a good story? What kind of information do you need to get started? Um, trying to hear from from you all as kind of writers and contributors, because uh, we've talked a lot about, about convening these projects and overseeing them. Annalee, yeah. Yeah, I'll just say a couple of things, which is um, I think the most helpful prompts that I've had were ones that asked me to consider secondary and tertiary effects of particular um, technologies or social movements. So not saying like, what is this piece of biotechnology going to look like? But instead, once we have that biotechnology, who's going to use it uh, for um, things that it wasn't supposed to be used for? What kinds of laws will it generate? What kinds of um, political backlash will it generate? And then maybe even taking another step, like, okay, what if we had political backlash? What's the next thing that will happen? Who's going to come back around and reclaim that technology and do something even different with it? Um, so I love doing that. And the other thing that I've found incredibly um, exciting is when where there's projects that bring together writers with experts, whether those are scientists or movement leaders, um, where I can actually sit down and interview someone and ask them really concrete questions. Like for me as a writer, I often will say like, describe the physical dimensions of your lab. Like I want to understand the actual places where people work. Mm -hmm. I want to understand things like when you're organizing a protest, how do you start? How do you, yeah, job shadowing, um, Tobias is saying. Yeah, and like, I actually did have an opportunity recently for a story I'm writing to interview a movement activist. And she was like, in the movies, you see these um, protests happen spontaneously. She was like, no, it's a year of planning and we're calling people and we're getting people to buy in and we're coordinating with groups. And so I love having that texture of realism available to me and also because that helps form a community right so now i'm in connection with people and i can talk to them in the future if i need experts too so i love both of those things uh august i'd, I'd love to hear from you on this question of approaching as a writer yeah you know we we play this role where you know when we work on our useful fiction projects we're kind of on both sides of that editorial uh you know, yeah. process and uh, you know, like Annalie was saying, you know, having that chance to talk with people who have done the things we're writing about or know it in a much, uh, you know, more intimate way than than I do, you know, especially as a civilian, uh, I think is really important. And it kind of goes back to, you know, the first order principle we're always thinking about, like, what's the ask of our story? Like, what are we trying to do with it? You know, what is the thing we want someone to think, feel, do, whatever? And and then, you know, who that audience is that we're trying to to kind of impact, you know, is it like other super, you know, senior generals, you know, who we need to be able to, hey, say, hey, you need to look up from your inbox for a minute at this 20 year out, you know, issue that has to be addressed today. And and so finding within those communities, the things that really speak to them. So that might be, for example, you know, everyone, um, you know, who's in Washington is always afraid of getting hauled in front of Congress, right? So you might create a narrative that has, you know, the format of like a congressional testimony of someone getting raked over the coals. Uh, you know, you're kind of trying to figure out like, where are those emotional and kind of rational aspects to connect with the reader? And, and it's not that you're writing a story for one person per se, but you are really trying to kind of in a design sense, understand, you know, what it is you're using the story for. I love that, that, that challenge, you know, that kind of upfront work. I'm a very disorganized or you know, uh, intuitive slash impulsive thinker and, and writer. And so I've had to kind of with, especially working on a co-writer, create a lot of process. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's been extremely helpful and has made my life less, you know, stressful in terms of the production side. And, and also it's made it, I think, more effective on, you know, collaborating with people too, because we get into more of a dialogue. So we have to kind of like lay out some things before Peter and I start writing. Uh, and that's true in the novels as well. We have a similar type process. And it's in fact, kind of where we derived it from. Uh, Tobias, please, and then we'll get to one more thing before we have to get booted off the call. Absolutely. Um, I think that, uh, you know, from the writer's side, you know, having an idea of, of what the plan is, what's going on is really helpful for us because it helps contextualize and line up with you instead of fighting with you as an organizer. That always is super helpful. Um, the other thing is just a, a sort of... Um, one of the things I've noticed from having done a few of these things is that there tends to be a, uh, a sort of like, you know, herd the, herd the creatives into a room and have an expert lecture them on the 101 level uh, stuff that they generally lecture general uh, audiences about. Um, that's yeah. usually what they tend to come prepared with. And uh, the, the most 
uh, the most interesting sessions have been a little bit more chaotic where it's like I said, job shadowing or um, just kind of shoving a bunch of experts into a room with a bunch of creatives and just letting the mingling happen. Um, that's uh, been where I've found like kind of a lot of, we can self sort really quickly into like, oh, I only know 101 about oceans, but I'm 301 at atmospheric heat. You know, I can go sit and talk to the oceanographer um and ask some simple questions or this 301 conversation over here is really fascinating i'm going to go i'm going to go join that kind of pod um that is uh because we don't know where this stuff is you don't know where the thing that lights up is going to happen right and then the more structured things you spend a lot of time kind of i don't know uh, expected to take notes. I'm ADHD, so like take this all with a grain of salt. Um, basically, structure doesn't work for me. Uh, but um, I found like just um, trusting the two groups um, can actually allow for some really interesting interaction. Uh, yeah, I that that we you know it, it, those of you who worked with CSI, you know that we're often putting people into small groups and then trying to mix things up and pepper that in with. Uh, solo working time and large group discussion and really have people like oscillating into lots of different like social configurations instead of this kind of like um yeah uh, uh one way communication of of um lectures and mini talks which i think for some small minority of people might be like optimal but like i think for yeah. most people it's like exhausting and overwhelming um and like you said but like it also that... it also allows us writers to um cross pollinate right yeah, because exactly. when it when it's done with the lecture at the writer lecture at the creative session um, the problem there becomes like we're actually usually tend to be really good generalists. And so mm -hmm. there actually may be something like three uh, three fields of study over that we know that yeah. we can bolt onto the conversation. <laughs> All right. So I've like mismanaged our time. These are always three hour conversations that we're doing in an hour, but uh, I, I want to round Robin uh, to all of you with this last thing that I really think it's worth getting to. So uh, in our prep, we talked a little about Octavia's Brood, which is a, an anthology that's dedicated to Octavia Butler and gets into issues of social justice in the future. Um, and, you know, we all sort of like know that collection. We know people who've read it and been really inspired by it and people whose work has been sort of changed by reading that and similar anthologies that are focused um, on justice and equity issues, for example. Um, but it, it is a good example of something that's extremely hard to gauge impact. And I think as we've all talked about organizations and funders and publishing metrics, how do you start to gauge the impact of these projects? And I know I'm not giving you each time at all really to talk about this, but I am wondering if we can do a quick round robin of like, what is the a sort of insight or lesson or thought or, or, or partially formed notion about how we should think about um, impact for folks to take away as we close here? Uh, I'm gonna go to you first, August, sorry. Yeah, I tend to rely a lot on anecdotal uh, impact. You know, if someone, uh, again, a, a general is going to go brief a, a, a conference or an event using one of our stories as a read ahead for what they're going to talk about, you know, there's that piece. I think that you just metrics from like downloads, you know, we did something for the Australian Army on the future of learning, right? Not normally something you'd write, you know, a military sci-fi story to, but, you know, over 10,000 downloads, the head of their Defense Force read it, a bunch of four stars in the U.S., you know, so you kind of have to collect the metrics that matter, I think, to your audience. Uh, rather than worrying about kind of coming up with like a broader category that may be apt outside your field. Yeah. Uh, Tori? Yeah, sorry about that. I'm going to go with anecdotal as well. Like we, you know, there's, we do surveys and we get, we collect information from the writers as well as the readers who um, are engaged with us. And just hearing someone say like, I write different now, you know, I write differently now. I am going to put down the dystopian pen and I'm going to pick up the hopeful pen because now I can like my brain works different because you know it might have took me a few months but now I'm like operating in a different way I'm kind of um so we've heard that a few times from folks um but then there's like the regular metrics that we use to kind of see if there's impact you know from grist being a media organization has all the widgets that kind of like track what's going on with our site and seeing that like this thing went from you know, something that was an idea to 200,000, you know, page views for a particular story, that's like pretty amazing. So um, we know that there's an audience out there. Um, we don't have comments on our stories or anything, but we do have people inboxing us um, through the email and just saying, you know, that they're using this for curriculum at the university yes. level. 
um, using it in classrooms because some of the stories are not like they're they're kind of all ages. And so I've had elementary school teachers say, hey, I'm using this to kind of illustrate, um, you know, the power of storytelling. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's just like a lot of different um, feedback loops that, you know, are helping us understand where there's impact. Unfortunately, I wish I could, you know, gather more. <laughs> like I always wanna know more, um, but what what we are hearing is positive. Um, and encouraging. Yeah, thank you. Plus one for the uh, teachers and people using classrooms for our open access books, we've added an optional sort of form just at the bottom of each download page that is just like, hey, if you're using this, we'd just love to hear how and like people, you know, scattershot answer those and just to see like just anecdotal, it's very partial, but all the diversity of context in which people are using these books. Uh, it's it's really cool. So I I really agree with that. Um, we'll go Amy, Annalie, Tobias, and then I'm going to have to zip this bag back closed. So Amy. All right. Well, um, it's as tough as everyone has already said. I think there are some good uh, external markers that sometimes give you some idea of impact. Um, so, for example, from the Democracy Project, one of the stories from the Omenina themed issue was selected for the 2022 Year's Best African Speculative Fiction Anthology. Um, quite a few of them were included on the 2022 Nebula's recommended reading list, and I know at least one story from the Mithila Review issue was spotlit by a professional reviewer's roundup. But then I think there's another piece of getting at the impact on the people who are writing. Uh, particularly when they are not people who identify as professional writers. Um, and for that, if you're doing a project like that, I really encourage you to in interview them, to include some piece of reflection so that they can actually tell you how it has impacted them because they are the best experts on that. And that's a great thing and easy thing to do while you've got them there for your project. Annalie. Yeah, I actually just got back from doing um, a fellowship at the Marine Biological Laboratory in uh, Woods Hole, and uh, I was working with a lot of uh, environmental researchers. We were taking environmental samples of nitrogen to look at nitrogen loading in the environment, which is wrecking their local ecosystems. Um, and one of the things that I was so amazed by was how many of the scientists were reading science fiction and we're engaging with it as a way of thinking about the future. And there was a, a scientist there who studies um, octopuses as a model organism. And he'd been reading Ray Naylor's novel, Mountain in the Sea. And he was like, Ray Naylor read one of my papers and like is using these ideas. And they felt like they were in dialogue with science fiction writers. And it was, and they were very excited that I was a science fiction writer too. And that to me felt like, impact that there's this way that we're that I felt like our work is reaching people who really are out there in the field doing this work and need to have a vision of a future that we're working toward we're not just sitting in the lab with our mass specs we're like actually trying to improve these estuaries which is a much bigger problem around the world um, and so I felt like that was a fantastic, I, it made me feel very hopeful that they could see their work in the context of these larger stories and these projects that we've been working on. Thank you. Tobias, final words before I wrap up. Yeah. Um, what's the question again? I was just uh, so busy impact. listening to what people were saying. The impact. Gauging yes, thank you. insights about gauging how to gauge impact, impact or anecdotes or I, I, lessons I or questions. I think like at that point, we have to like, uh, you know, uh, follow Tori's lead and be hopeful um, and know that with all writing, you never know what piece of writing is going to land, where and when have what impact. You know, uh, a novel with a hundred copies could land in just the right person's hand who is inspired by that book. Or even like, you know, just in my separate field of just a novelist, you know, um, a, a uh, an anthology or something that doesn't sell many copies or, or was in a small anthology that almost no one read someone will come up to you 20 years later and say that story changed my entire life. And what, you know, was that a failure because it only, you know, went to a small anthology that sold a few hundred copies um, or was it a success because it changed one person's life or, or got them through a tough time or something like that. Um, I find this really hard to quantify other than yeah. if you want to go into this, there's a certain Zen approach to just sort of letting go of that quantifying everything and just saying we're doing this because it needs to exist. Yeah, our friend Vandana Singh says we're, we're putting 
uh, uh, new entries into the archive of possible futures and that that yes. in and of itself has some value. And I think, yeah, that idea of like, um, we talk a lot about optimizing for certain things, but yeah, you don't like, it's, it's unpredictable what meaning people are going to make out of, out of a, a text. And um, those are, those feel like the most rewarding uh, stories. So thank you all for, for sharing about impact. Um, and I'm so sorry to have to cut this short and I'm so sorry that we didn't have time for audience Q and A, although once I looked at the list of questions we concocted, I suspected that might be the case. So I'm uh, apologize for those of you who submitted questions. Um, I, I just want to thank everyone uh, who is involved in making this possible. So uh, the Applied Sci-Fi Project is uh, uh, supported by a grant from the Sloan Foundation. Um, thank you to Kevin for doing all of the uh, vital organizing for this event, as well as uh, Rizwan Burke, our, uh, our researcher on this project, and Ed Finn, our co-director, uh, who is out of the country and couldn't be with us today. Um, you can watch previous uh, conversations on video at applied at the Applied Sci-Fi website. I just dropped in the chat. Everybody uh, should be able to see that. Um, and we hope you'll watch that. And this uh, event will be available archived on video as well. Um, and thank you all so much, uh, Tobias, Amy, Tori, August, Annalie, for being here. This has been very edifying. All right, everybody have a good rest of the day. Thanks for being with us.